Good morning. It's good to see you. Um, let me just tell you, I come from the city of Cape Town, which you heard. What you may not know is that almost every year it is voted by international tourists as the, in the top three or four destinations in the world as a tourist destination. So if you win the lottery one day and don't know how to spend your money, come and visit Cape Town. It's a very, very beautiful uh, city on the bottommost tip of the African continent. I'm going to talk to you today about a subject that is going to leave you, hopefully, feeling good. You know, sometimes preachers are called by God to kind of get in your face and make you examine yourself, and that's valid. And other times, what we do is to just build you up. And uh, so I hope that by the time you're walking out of here, you're going to be in even a better mood than you are now. Right. My subject is being made in the image of God. When we become Christians, one of the words we use for it is to be born again, to be reborn. And we invite Jesus into our lives, and as a result of that, we change. We start thinking differently, feeling differently, having different goals. And one of the songs we sing in the vineyard is how God changes us from the inside out. He comes right inside of us, and he starts changing us. What? actually happens when Jesus comes into your life and starts changing you? Well, this is the way the Bible looks at it. In these two passages, both of them talk about the old you and the new you. You have taken off your old self with its practices and have put on your new self, it says in Colossians. And then it says in Ephesians, you were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is corrupted, etc., and to be made new, and to put on your new self. Your old self is the you before you came to Christ. The way you thought, the way you behaved, the way you had desires. But now that you've come to Jesus, there's a new person. What is the essence of that new you? The new you is being put back in the image of God to being renewed in the knowledge of the image of its creator in Colossians, or to put on the new self created to be like God in God's image in true righteousness and holiness. And the more you grow in Jesus, the more you are being restored to the image of God. So the big question then is, what is it to be in the image of God? What, do we, what does the Bible mean when it says, we are made in the image of God. And that's what I'm going to be on about this morning. And of course, the passage that begins this is the Genesis creation story, where God made us in his image. And that's what I'm going to be focusing on. Now, just a few things about Genesis in today's world. It's about the Bible and science. Out there in the world today, there are not so sensible views on the Bible and science, and very sensible ideas about the Bible and science. And those who oppose science and the Bible are not helping us very much, because they're putting up barriers to people coming to faith, or they creating ideas that when our kids get to high school or to university or college, then they start uh, doubting their faith. Why? Because they were originally given the wrong idea of the relationship between science and Scripture. So I just want to mention a few helpful um, resources. I'm going to be drawing quite a lot this morning on a book by an American scholar called John Walton, The Lost World of Genesis 1. Excellent. There's another book by uh, an English theologian um, and scientist together, can we believe Genesis today? And his answer is definitely uh, you can. 
Then there's a really exceptional website that is uh, based on a charity, so all the, all the expenses are, are funded by other people, um, linked to Cambridge University in England, which you probably know is one of the prestigious universities in the world, called the Faraday Institute. And if you go there, you can watch lectures or download articles of all the top Christian scientists in the world today, American and British and elsewhere, like 40 of them. Uh, some of the most qualified academics. Uh, some of them are particularly into apologetics, which is the defense of the Christian faith. Um, and you will find there that you land up with absolutely no contradiction between modern science and biblical teaching, provided you read the Bible with the right lenses on. And so this leads to um, the way I'm going to be reading Genesis. A cardinal um, principle of reading the Bible is you must read the Bible in context, not take it out of its context. And the Genesis creation stories were written in a world where there were many other creation stories, from Babylon, from Egypt, from Canaan, etc. And the Genesis story, to be rightly interpreted, must be read in that context and in comparison with what are called ancient Near East. Near Eastern creation narratives, and that's what this guy John Walton does. And when you do that, you find two things. First of all, if you read them and then you read the Bible, Genesis 1 and 2, you can see it's the same language, it's the same ideas, and you think, wow, these, these guys are talking about the same thing in the same way. At the same time, however, the biblical narrative is directly clashing and intentionally repudiating the beliefs that come out of the other creation narratives. So it's against them, especially in terms of their uh, polytheism, belief in many gods, pantheism, which is that the universe is God or God is the universe, whereas the biblical story is about one living God who's the creator of all things and he is sovereign over his creation. So all that I'm going to be doing today is drawing on reading Genesis in a proper literary interpretation of it in its context. So, there are two chapters, Genesis 1 and Genesis 2. Genesis 1, the name for God all the way through is Elohim, which just is a general word for God. But in Genesis 2, the name for God is Yahweh Elohim. And Yahweh was the unique name revealed to Moses. It literally means, I am who I am of God as the covenant-keeping God, the God who came and liberated Israel from Egypt, took them and made, it, made them his covenant people. And in Genesis 2, that is the name of God that is used. So it is all about covenant in, in chapter 2. Now, chapter 1, uh, this passage, I'm sure you've read many times. And before it, is all the six days of creation. God made the earth and the sun and the moon and the creepy crawlies and everything he made. And then notice that it says, then God said, let us make man in our image. And what happens is that when God made us, his, this was his climactic act of creation. Everything else is important, but then the climax of the story as you. And so after he'd made everything else, the ver first line there it says, and God saw that it was good. But after he made us, the last line, and God saw all he had made when he made us, and he said it was very good. So start feeling good about yourself. All right. What does God feel when he looks at you? Very good. Then notice that twice it talks about us being made in his image. Then God said, let us make man in our image. And then again, a little bit later, so God created man in his own image, in the image of God. So clearly this is the point. And both times, after saying he made us in his image, then there is language about us ruling. And let them rule over all the creepy crawlies. And again, be fruitful and multiply, rule over 
all of nature. So whatever else it means to be made in the image of God, the main point about man being made in the image of God is you were born to be a king. A ruler under God who is the supreme ruler. So our dignity, our royalty, is the point that is being made when it says we are made in the image of God. Then, if you read the whole of Genesis 1, what also comes out, especially if you read the other ancient Near Eastern literature, is that God is being exalted as the conquering king over nature. In these ancient stories, uh, there was always a kind of fight that went on between the gods. They Sometimes they'd make love to each other and beget the earth, or they'd fight some evil powers and then win. And at the end of it, they, the, king were, the, the god would rest in the temple. And to, to rest in the temple means I fought the fight, I've won the battle, and now I'm resting. And at the end of the creation of six days and the seventh day, what does God do? He rests. So it's the story of a battle that God wins. And in these ancient narratives, you, the, the enemy was always some very scary, massive sea monster called the Leviathan. And after the gods beat Leviathan, then they uh, were victorious. Now, Genesis is telling us there's no such big scary sea monster. In fact, the sea, scary sea monster is just God's pet in the ocean. But the way the story is told dramatically is of the creator God being victorious in his creation. The chaos is brought into order as he speaks um, creation into existence. And each step of creation is under his command. God speaks, let there be light, and there's light. God speaks, let the earth bring forth creatures, and the earth brings forth creatures. This is the activity of somebody in command. Kings are in command. So it's a story of God as the great king creator, the victorious king creator. Let me quote from a biblical scholar who explains this to us. What Genesis 1 is undertaking and accomplishing is a radical and sweeping affirmation of monotheism vis-a-vis Polytheism, syncretism, and idolatry. So one only living God versus the belief in many gods and the idolatrous worship of many gods. Each day of creation dismisses an additional cluster of deities. On the first day, the gods of light and darkness are dismissed. On the second day, the gods of sky and sea. On the third day, the, god, the earth gods and the gods of vegetation. On the fourth day, sun, moon, and star gods. The fifth and sixth days take away any association of divinity with the animal kingdom. And finally, human existence too is emptied of any intrinsic divinity, while at the same time, all human beings, from the greatest to the least, and not just pharaohs, kings and heroes, are granted a divine likeness and mediation. So, this defeating or uh, stripping of belief in many gods, not only happens in the creation story, but it also happens in the Exodus story. If you read the story of the plagues of Egypt, in context, with each plague, one or more of the gods of Egypt are pulled down. So when the Nile turns to blood, Harpy, the Nile god, is killed. And because this is mosaic uh, literature, the Pentateuch was all written in the, by, by Moses. The story of the Exodus and the story of the creation are told in parallel to each other. And both of them are saying, whatever the pagans believe in many gods, we know there's only one living God. And all these other gods have been stripped of their belief. See, And all these primitive ideas that the sun is a god and the moon is a god, all of that has been changed because there's one and, living, one and only living God. And so... He exercises authority by his spoken word. And you'll see in chapter 2, man also then exercises authority under God. That point that has just been made in that quote, it's not just um, 
one or two kings in the ancient world that are made in the image of God, but all of humanity is made in the image of God. And this point is made by uh, a well-known evangelical commentator. What then does Genesis 1 signify by designating man as made in the image of God? We have had occasion to mention uh, several ways in which Genesis 1 uh, narrates the creation story in a way radically different from the creation accounts of neighboring cultures. It's like a clashing against what they say. Perhaps such polemicizing continues here. It is well known that in both Egyptian and Mesopotamian society, the king or some high-ranking official might be called the image of God. Such a designation, however, was not applied to the canal digger or to the mason working on a ziggurat or to normal dudes like you and me. Genesis 1 may be using royal language to describe simply man, all mankind. In God's eyes, all mankind is royal. All of humanity is related to God, not just the king. Specifically, the Bible democratizes the royalistic and exclusivistic concepts of the nations that surround Israel. So you could say, where does democracy and the sense of equality of all humanity comes from? It starts right in the creation of humanity in the biblical story. Then what is important is that he makes this royal dignity he gives us equally to male and female. We are God's vice regents ruling under him, and this applies equally to males and females. So the idea of the equality of the sexes is also very clearly taught in this narrative. Not only the equality of the sexes, but the differentiation of the sexes. He made us male and female. And this is very clearly seen if you see the creation of man in the, as the climax of the whole story. Right the way through the creation story, again and again, there is differentiation. The creator is different from creation, as opposed to many pagan beliefs. Light as opposed to darkness. Heaven as opposed to earth. Sea as opposed to land. Day as opposed to night. Male as opposed to female. So the, the fact that we were made different from each other is as important in this narrative as the way that, that we were made equal to each other. Neither masculinity on its own nor femininity on its own makes up the image of God. We have to be in relationship with someone different from us to be fully human. That doesn't mean only married people are fully human, because if you've got a brother or a sister, or whatever you are in community, you are faced with a gender person different from you. And the great theologian Karl Barth said that the individuality, uniqueness, and riddle of maleness and womanness are essential to the fellowship of man with his fellow man. See, guys, can any of you please come and tell me how women think? <laughs> Have you ever had a problem with trying to understand how women think? And, and you know, this, isn't there a book, Men Are From Mars and Women Are From Venus, or whatever it is? I, I always joke about the fact my wife and I love to do, you know, home renovations. I built a kitchen for us, and we're just busy changing the back of our house into a flat so we can rent it out. Well, when we get into stuff like that, we have multiple divorces, I can tell you. <laughs> because I want to build it in a way that is practical, it's going to last, maybe it's not so expensive, and all that. She has a completely different agenda. She says, Derek, that's going to be awful. Really? Yeah, it's the wrong color, and it's got the wrong texture, and of course, whatever she wants is always very expensive by comparison with me. And in the end, we kind of build it and live happily ever after. But um, isn't it amazing how, how we, we really are inherently different from, from each other? And, and the biblical creation story is saying, celebrate that. This is the way God made us. God did not make us into two androgynous or same-sex creatures. He made us with the wonder of the differentiation of the sexes. Then, this story of the creation is told again and again in dramatic or poetic language in the Psalms. You can see the same faith of Israel coming through. So here's a psalm that is celebrating the greatness of God the Creator. 
and notice this whole idea of the victory over the great scary sea monster. Um, they're using the language of the, of the Canaanite context, but changing it into Israelite faith. You, O oh God, are my king from of old. See, it's the kingship of God. It was you who split open the sea by your power. You broke the heads of the monster in the waters. It was you who crushed the heads of Leviathan and gave him his food to the creatures of the desert. Um, and so on. It goes on celebrating God's sovereign rule over all of creation. He's not part of creation like the pagans believe. Creation isn't God as the pagans believe. No, we worship a king creator God who is sovereign over all that he has made. And equally, the Psalms describe us as his vice regents. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars you have set in place. And don't you often, do you do that? I, like, I love nature, by the way. I love being in national parks and put me in the African bush with deadly snakes and terrifying creatures and, uh, and a pair of binoculars and I am in my element. I love just looking at the wonder of nature. What is man that you are mindful of him, the son of man that you care for him? And it's not a question saying, well, well, how important is man? No, it's saying, wow, what is man like? You made him a little lower than the heavenly beings or the gods. In other words, you made us just below divinity. You crowned him with glory and honor. You made him ruler over the works of your hands, all the creepy crawlies. O oh Lord, and that's the name Yahweh, our Lord, how majestic is your name. In all the earth, you see. You can see they are celebrating the same theology that comes out of the Genesis creation narratives. Genesis 2, I'm hardly going to go into it. It would take too much time. But I want to bring two important points out of Genesis 2. These are words you've read many times. First of all, in the top there, when the Lord God made the earth and the heavens, the Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. Now, those two phrases, literally it means he lifted us up from the dust, and then he breathed into us the breath of life. Other thing is, notice it says, when the Lord God, and it's Lord, capital L-O-R-D. In your Bible, whenever you find that, that is signifying that the Hebrew word is Yahweh the covenant name of God. So if you read this literally, it would be, when the Yahweh God made the earth and the heavens. Verse 8, now Yahweh God planted a garden. Verse 15, Yahweh God took the man. And so it goes on all the way through, Yahweh God. Chapter 2, verse 18, Yahweh God said, it is not good for man to be alone. Let's make him a wife for him, and so on. So when you get into Genesis 2, you're in the in the context of covenant relationship. And that's what it's all about. Now, this thing about the breath of life being breathed into the nostrils comes right out of the ceremonies of ancient Near Eastern temples. And what they used to do is they would build their idol to their God, and they always had a kind of big ceremonial day. Sometimes they did it every year at one of their festivals, where the idol would be breathed into, and the idea is from that moment on, the spirit of the God literally was in the idol. And what, what Genesis is saying is if you go into the Jewish temple, there's no idol. But what you do find is you. You are God's representative on earth. In the place of all the gods and all their idols, God puts us there. We are literally God's idols on earth because he breathed, he breathed into us in a way that they breathed into idols, so he breathes into us. And so this is what another scholar says. In the ancient Near East, it was widely believed that a God's spirit lived in any statue or image of the God, with the result that the image could function as a surrogate for the God's dominion wherever it was placed. It was also customary in the ancient Near East to think of a king as a representative of a God. Since, the world, since in the world the king rules under the ultimate ruler 
of his God, the king must be ruling in his God's behalf. Not surprisingly, therefore, these two distinct surrogates for the God and the king became connected, and the king came to be described as an image of the God. And so when Genesis says, God breathed into you and made you in his image, what it's saying is, you are the king that replaces all the idols. And all idolatry is just blown out of the window because if anybody is to be seen as glorious on the earth, it's you made in the image of God. Then this thing of the dust. To be raised from the dust means to be elevated to royal office, to rise above poverty, to find life. Here man is formed from the dust to be in control of the garden. Thus, the emphasis on the dust in Genesis 2-7 affirms chapters 1's view of man's regality. That means man's royalty. He is raised from the dust to reign. It is man as representative of subsequent humanity who receives the divine breath. It is not something only for the elite of society. So there's a cutting down of the idea of great and powerful human beings and an affirmation of all of us equally being made in the image of God and male and female in the image of God and as such we are God's kings on earth, ruling under him. Then in the middle of the garden <coughs> is the tree of life and in all of these ancient Near Eastern narratives, the tree of life is a symbol of immortality. So we have been made to live forever. And you can find any kind of human tribe as old as you like in their paintings from the very beginning of humanity is the sense that there is a life beyond this life and we were not made to die. And so you run forward to the story of the resurrection of Jesus and that just as he has conquered death, so he will raise our bodies one day and ultimately we will live forever back in a resurrected body. And it says, oh death, where is your sting? Oh death, where is your victory? That is inherent in being a human being. That knowledge I was made not to just grow old and die. It's been placed in you by God the creator. And then if you... Read the Genesis narrative and you read the book of Exodus where it has the creation of the tabernacle and later on the creation of the temple. What is very plain is that they are described as a mirror image of each other. And the garden is a gigantic cosmic temple. And the tabernacle is a symbol of a cosmic garden. And the ruler in the middle of this universe is God the great king. And the way he rules this great universe which is a gigantic temple, is to have us as his representatives ruling the earth. So the language of us caring for the garden was language used for priests in temples, which means we aren't just called to be kings, we are called to be priests, to be those who serve God in his cosmic temple. And the language of God commanding and Adam obeying and later disobeying, tragically, is the language of covenant relationship. God entering into a covenant relationship with man. And the woman is brought to the man, and if you go into that detail, basically, Genesis 2 is the first marriage ceremony. And God is the marriage officer, and he brings these two wonderful creatures who are naked and they look at each other and they find each other absolutely delightful. And God makes this whole thing, this covenant relationship between man and his fellow man. So, we've done a kind of quick treatment of Genesis 1 and 2 in its original historical context of ancient Near Eastern literature. And you can see the point is not to try and make some sort of modern scientific statement. It's all about man in the image of God. And I began by saying this is what God is doing for us when we come to Christ. He is remaking us in his image. So what is it to be in the image of God? We can now bring this to a summary. To be in the image of God means that you are the climax of all of God's creation, a vice regent or king under God, a royal 
priestly figure, and because God is a great victorious God, you were made to be a victorious person under God. Second, this royal priesthood is given to all human beings, male and female. So any kind of idea of male superiority, guys, sorry to tell you, it is blown out of the window, all right? He made us equally in his image, with equal dignity. Thirdly, he made us sexually differentiated, ideally suited to each other. And it is in that relationship that we find our true meaning and our true humanity. Whether we married or whether we simply in society, we are made to be in relationship with humans different from us, who question us, and in that we find our humanity. Fourthly, we were called to exercise authority over nature. So you could say Genesis 1 sets you up as the ultimate green Christian, right? The environment is supposed to be our responsibility. We're not supposed to pollute our rivers and burn the atmosphere and create global warming. We were supposed to responsibly rule nature. Five, we were created with eternity in our hearts. We just know inside, I was made to live forever. Six, we were made intensely relational people. There's one point that comes out of Genesis 2. We were built for relationship. Relationship with God and relationship with our fellow human in covenant. And then thing that really all this drives to is that only in Jesus Christ can we find this. Why is that? Because sin came into the world and broke the image of God. Imagine a mirror that you've been looking at every morning to see your face and you see yourself and it's wonderful and then somebody puts a fist through it and it's all shattered. And you look at that mirror and it's still, you, you are looking back at you, but you all sort of, you know, mm, kind of messed up. And, and what's happened is sin has come in and has broken the image of God. And so we know that experience in so many ways. Whether it's sometimes people grow up in, in, in families of origin where instead of being loved, they're abused. Some people go through marriages where instead of being affirmed, they, they are manipulated and, and misused. Sometimes in society, uh, just think of what's happening to the refugees coming out of Syria right now. Instead of this world being a safe place, it's a terrifying place. And worse of all is that we know deep within us something has gone wrong inside of me. And I suppose the, the most difficult thing we've got to live with is, is, as humans is the sense of shame because we don't live up to our own expectations of ourselves, let alone the expectations of others. And all of this is the human predicament we've been dragged down into, away from this great exalted destiny we were given. But here's the good news. In Jesus coming to this world, not only was he divine, but more importantly in this subject, he was the perfect human being made in the image of God. And that's why, for instance, he had such authority over nature. He could speak to a, a storm and it obeyed him. That was originally destined for us, but we lost it. But when Jesus comes into your life, what happens is that very nature of man perfectly made in the image of God is re-begotten inside of you. It's born within you. And as you grow in Christ from one day to the other, the more you, you, you go into a deeper and deeper intimate relationship with Jesus, the more he is restoring you to the dignity of and royalty and priesthood that you were made to have. And so, um, God wants to restore you to your true greatness. Let me, let me end by saying this. If there's anybody here today that hasn't definitely and decisively invited Jesus into your life, or you're not sure, maybe you prayed the prayer and you don't know if it kind of happened, let me tell you, life begins when Jesus comes into your heart. You have no hope of being restored to your dignity as a human being 
unless he who is the ultimate human being is born again in your heart. See, Don't leave this place. Don't spend another week of your life until you know that you have got the regeneration of the Holy Spirit working inside of you. Okay. But even if you're a Christian, there's a lot that happens to us to just pull us down, pull us down, pull us down all the time and mess us up. But what God is saying to you this morning, lift up your chin. I'm lifting you up from the dust of the earth. I'm reordaining you to your kingship and your priesthood. And you know, when we do ministry time and we pray for the Holy Spirit to come and touch us, and God works in our lives, and many, many, that's what's happening. It is the power of the Holy Spirit that restores us in that way. So let me pray for you quickly. Maybe you could stand because your brain's got tired now. Let's all stand, do a sort of kind of ceremonial wake up. Um, if you've never prayed a prayer inviting Jesus into your heart, just silently where you're standing, this prayer may help you if you echo it in, in, in your heart. God, as I stand here today, I now realize I need Jesus, your son, to come into my life. Without him, I have no hope. I'm empty. And so, Jesus, by your spirit, I invite you this very moment to come into my heart. Come deep within me and begin to change me. Restore me into your image. Thank you, Lord. But also, I just want to reach out now for those who are Christians and somehow, you know, life and relationships and events have just pulled you down and discouraged you. And as you stand there, I just bless you in the name of Jesus. And I say, come, Holy Spirit. Come and touch your people that have been pulled down and lift them up today, Lord. Let them hear again their calling to greatness and majesty and dignity. And Lord, come by your Holy Spirit and keep doing that work of transformation in us so that we are transformed from one degree of glory to another. And thank you, Lord, that we look for that day where ultimately, when we see you, we will be exactly like you because you would have finished your work of transformation in our lives. Thank you, Lord, that... We have a future filled with hope because of the work you're doing in our lives. Amen.